So, hello, good evening and welcome. Um, so, no one has joined um, yet, but still, we are going to get started with the lesson for this evening. And, um, well, for tonight, we are actually going to be covering something, well, very crucial. It's a topic related to three word phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs, just in case you guys didn't know, is um, something that, well, it closely relates to ideas that cannot be expressed with only one word. So in Spanish, we normally um, will have, well, a different word to express something different, you know? So each word will have a specific meaning. But in English, sometimes there are words that are combined. They are put together to create a new meaning. And those are the ones that we are going to recognize as phrasal verbs. So the verbs that um, don't have one specific word to refer to them, they are going to be, hey there. Um, so we have some people coming in and welcome to the class. Welcome to our um, ninth class in, in this module. We are tonight, as I was mentioned in previously, because, you know, as always, I have to start recording on time. Um, we are going to be talking about phrasal verbs. That's like the main idea for this evening. We have another topic before we get to the phrasal verbs. We also have to talk about have and get something done, um, explaining the difference that exists when you want to to have something to be done. Last night, I remember I mentioned something about that and we didn't really have the time to um, to cover the topic. But for this evening, we are going to be talking about um, have or get something done. But I was um, also explaining a little bit on what the phrasal verbs are. In Spanish, we normally, when um, we are talking, well, about anything, we have one word that conveys one meaning. And that's a very common thing in our language. And that's why it's so tricky to learn to speak Spanish because there are so many words in our vocabulary and we sometimes have two or three words to refer to the same specific thing. Um, but in English, many actions or many um, things that you do that we know them as verbs, um, don't have one specific word. They sometimes um, <clears throat> have to come, come along with two or three words so that you can convey that meaning. So that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. And those are normally referred to as three word phrasal verbs. So those are like the main things we're going to be talking about. Um, and well, as I mentioned before, the have or get something done. But as per usual, before we talk about the topics um, that we have in the class, I always like to ask you guys a question. Now, for this evening, I think the question comes a little bit related to what I've been doing. Um, and I would like to know what has been the most exotic thing you have ever eaten. So what is the most exotic thing you have eaten? Um, and let's start with Beatriz. So what do you think, Beatriz, will be the most exotic thing, exotic thing you have eaten? Uh, sorry, teacher, I have a problem with my computer. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah. Um, what is the most exotic thing you have eaten? Um, I I don't understand. Sorry. <laughs> so the uh, la comida más exótica que oh. has probado. Carrobo. Um, Carrobo <laughs> has been the most exotic yeah. thing. Yes. And how was it but preferred? I don't like it. You don't like it? No. Oh, that's sad. Well, you know the garrobos are very common here in San Miguel. They are really good as well, I consider. But how, how was how was it prepared? When you had garrobo, um, what was it prepared like? Was it like with tomatoes or like a tomato sauce or how was it? Uh, 
Ah, uh, I, I, um, I eat with alguaste. Ah, okay, that's weird. <laughs> where, where did you yes, try very, that? Yes. Where, where, uh, where did you try that? Ah, uh, my, my mom. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, now that's weird. But, I have never heard of uh, garrobo and alguaste. Yes. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, maybe, something... maybe the, mm -hmm. the preparation uh, was warm. <laughs> yeah, probably that's why you didn't like it. Still, you know, some food is not for every every person, but um, yeah, garrobo in a wash is that's that's a new one for me. I have never heard of that. <laughs> All right, so yes. uh, that's the most exotic thing, garrobo in a wash. Um, how about you, Joel? What has been the most exotic thing you have ever eaten? Good evening. Good evening. Um, maybe, maybe the San Miguel pupusas could it be? The what? San Miguel pupusas. Oh, okay. Yes, I know was, where we're going. Really, <laughs> <laughs> yes, without any offense. But yeah, I didn't mayo. like it. I didn't like it. I ate then near to Metro Centro in San Miguel. Once I was visiting a beach close to, to San Miguel. Uh -huh. And they gave us these pupusas with ketchup instead of tomato sauce, sauce natural. Uh -huh. And they gave us mayonnaise and this, I don't, I don't know how to say salsa negra. Because yeah, like, it's not uh -huh. actually the, the name, salsa negra, but the uh -huh. black sauce. And it was <laughs> at work. It was different uh, <laughs> to what I am used to eat here in San Salvador. But it was uh, an exotic experience that I most definitely not repeat again. <laughs> again. Yeah, it's understandable. Now, I only have one question, and I'm sorry, it's not related to the food. The thing is, what would you do in Metro Centro if you were at a beach? Like, Metro Centro is really far from every yeah. single, every beach in San Miguel. Like, how did you end up in Metro Centro? We, we, left, we left San Salvador very early in the morning. Oh. So we, we, we were... Uh, going through that that part of uh, San Miguel. So like through into, downtown uh, in San Miguel? Yeah. Okay. So we need to have breakfast and we stop there to, uh, to okay. have some pupusas and then we continue to the beach. All right. Now it, it, make, it makes sense. So you took like La, like La Panamericana. That's why you guys were going through there. Yes. Yeah, because I was like, how? Like beaches are all in like the literal area of El Salvador and like you were in Metro Centro, you were visiting a beach because it's really far from, from all the beaches around here in, in um, well, in our towns, you know. But yeah, I know it's weird and it's different. Um, trying pupusas from San Miguel is, is experience. There are people here. Yes. I don't know if you guys knew that, but there are people around here. Um, it's been a long time, though, since I last tried them. But there are people who make pupusas with potatoes. Like, instead of having the regular meat, chicharrones, uh, beans, and everything they put inside the, inside the, the pupusas, um, they just make, like, a, a potato sauce. Like, tomatoes, um, onions, potatoes. And really? they, they taste good. Like, sometimes they make it taste like it's actually revueltas. But, yeah, it's potatoes. You're eating potatoes. And do you like then the, the pupusas, the typical from, from San Miguel with well, ketchup then? I don't have the ketchup. You know, like the ketchup is something I never, I never even open. Like um, there's a place near my house. Almost every Friday, me and my friends, we go to have pupusas there. And like the lady, she always has the, the regular things here in San Miguel, like the ketchup, the black sauce. They do have tomato sauce, um, like their natural tomato sauce. They have the mayonnaise um, cottage and the regular one, um, like the one from, from San Salvador. So I normally have the regular um, cabbage. Yeah, it was the regular cabbage with some um, tomato sauce. Sometimes, but just sometimes, I will add a little bit of the black sauce, but I almost never have that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say... I eat pupusas like people from San Salvador most regularly because, yeah, the, 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 the mayonnaise thing, I remember I was like 10 years old when I first tried it and I liked it. I, I, I loved it back then, but then it was just like, they don't make sense because they make pupusas too wet for my taste, at least. Um, but yeah, 
It's kind of weird. A little bit. Yeah. But still, yeah, for you, I, I can tell it's exotic. It's not, it's out of the regular. I mean, we normally have pupusas, that's our, our thing. And having pupusas prepare, being prepared like that, yeah, it's it's kind of weird. All right, moving on. Um, Evelyn, tell me, what has been the most exotic thing you have ever eaten? Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, maybe the food I, I tried is Rose Pennyway. I think that uh, that's the name. And yeah. I didn't like, uh, I think that I, I am a more traditional person and I don't like to try exotic food. <laughs> All right. I will second your motion. And, you know, I will be in favor of what you just said because it was the same for me. I will say that the best way to say Peliways in English will be lamb because it's basically the same. Um, but so it will be like roast lamb. And yeah, I also have a story for that. I remember three years ago. I don't know how to write Peliways. Oh, lamb. I think it will be lamb. Creo que sería la mejor forma de decirlo, ¿verdad? Lamb. Que es algo así como uh, oveja. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so I remember around three to four years ago, my dad was really excited because he was going to get a peliway for Christmas. And he was like, okay, so we're going to have the whole thing. We're going to roast it. We're going to invite some friends. And it's going to be amazing. He thought, uh, or I mean, they had told us that that mead was basically the best meat out there because it was very greasy and it was tasty. Now, I don't know if it was because the peli we got was too skinny or if it's only the thing that I wasn't ready for that. I didn't really enjoy it because for me, it was merely just bones and yeah, no meat. So only bones. That's, that's what I felt at least. And it really wasn't my favorite. I, I remember that that day, I had gotten like two pounds of regular beef for my girlfriend. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? We're going to share that because I didn't enjoy this meat. So I'm going to have um, like beef and not meat. Ahora, esa es otra cosa que les quería decir hablando acerca de esto de las carnes. Um, no sé si ustedes conocen esta función, que es algo que a veces nos llega a confundir. Y esto se los explico en español directamente porque para que quede 100% claro. Um, similar a lo que ayer, a lo que, algo que sucedió ayer con Emma, que, pre, que ella preguntaba, ¿verdad? Alguna, algunas palabras que eh, se usan a veces como de forma similar, eh, tenemos también esto, ¿sí? El, la diferencia entre meat, o cuando decimos meat, y cuando decimos beef, ¿sí? Cuando hablamos de meat, es carne, o sea, en general, puede ser cualquier tipo de carne, ¿sí? O sea, si ustedes, por ejemplo, no comen carne, ustedes pueden decir, I don't eat meat. Pero, si ustedes se quieren referir directamente a la carne de res, entonces ahí se utilizaría la segunda palabrita que envía ahí, sería beef, ¿sí? Siempre que hablamos acerca de la, de la, um, la carne de res específicamente, sería beef. Ustedes pueden decir, ¿verdad? Um, por ejemplo, si estamos en un en una reunión y ustedes tienen un pedazo de carne que se está asando y es el suyo, ustedes pueden decir, that's my meat, o sea, esa es mi carne, sí, no hay problema. Pero um, si ustedes están compartiendo, por ejemplo, cuál es su tipo de carne favorita, alguien dice que, oh, I, I love lamb. Otro puede decir, oh, I enjoy having deer, que sería eh, la, la carne de venado, ¿verdad? deer. Um, somebody else may say, I, I love um, chicken, yeah, maybe. And then you may say that you love beef because that's the proper way to refer to carne de res, beef. And there is also a difference between um, the living animal. When you talk about pigs, you're not going to say pig when you refer to the meat, when you refer to the thing you're going to eat. Cuando hablamos acerca de lo que comemos en cuestión de los, uh, de los cerditos, no decimos pig, sino que decimos pork. Sí, la, ya la, la carne muerta ya para consumir um, sería pork, no va a ser pig. Pig es cuando está vivo y pork es cuando ya se va a consumir. So pig and pork también sería verdad una eh, diferencia importante que se deberá tener en cuenta. Ok, now for um, Emma. Tell me Emma, what has been the most exotic thing you have eaten? 
I think that it was Mexican candies because I don't like candies actually because I don't used to eat many sweet things, but I like Mexican candies because there are a different taste. It's not so sweet, but it's not like how do Candy. you say pecan? Oh, spicy. Yes, I think. Thanks. And it's not it's spicy, but it's not sweet. It's like a mix, and that's why I like it. Yeah, I, I second that too. I remember I had this sister-in-law. Um, she's um she went to Mexico once. I was still very little. I think I was like 11 years old. But yeah, she brought some candy back from Mexico. And that's one of the things that I enjoyed because the candy wasn't like sweet. It was sweet, but like at the bottom of the candy. But on top, you had these flavors like lime, lemon, um, I don't know, a little bit of the of the fruit that was used to make the candy. But it wasn't really like just a straight up candy, like super sweet candy. So yeah, now here we have a difference. When we talk about spicy, when we say spicy, ustedes probablemente si ya han ido a Wendy's, um, se han fijado que en ese restaurante se usa bastante. La palabra de spicy se refiere a cuando la comida tiende a sentirse picante, pero no necesariamente porque, te, porque sea picante, ¿sí? sino que por la cantidad de especias que tiene. Entonces, spicy sería algo que tiene, o sea, muchas especias. ¿sí? Y hot sería algo que es directamente picante, o sea, algo que tiene chile o algo que directamente, o sea, es a propósito, ¿verdad? Que se hizo picante. Spicy es, o sea, si ustedes están agregando pimienta y un montón de, de, de especias, y al final resulta pues que su comida se siente picante, sería spicy. Pero hot es cuando directamente ustedes, o sea, están consumiendo algo eh, picante, o sea, que están seguros que eso es lo que van a sentir a la hora de consumir ese alimento. Así que es una diferencia también. Otro par de palabras, ¿verdad? Se parecen, pero no son exactamente lo mismo. Ok. Um, and Daniel, can you please share with us what has been the most exotic thing you have eaten? Hi, teacher. Hey there. I just joined to the class. It's okay. It's okay. Welcome. So tell me, what has been the most exotic thing you have eaten? La comida más exótica que ha probado. Ah, uh, eh, anca de rana. Okay. When where did you try that? Um, eh, I I went to the Laguna de las Ranas. Oh really? Uh, yes, yes, yes. And and over there, uh, we we este nosotros cazamos ranas. Really? Con, con, le sacamos punta a los palitos ba, y comenzamos a buscar ranas. Ba. Uh -huh. Y las cazábamos y después solo las ancas las poníamos este, a, como a hacer las asadas. Uh -huh. Eso es lo más exótico quizás. And did you like it? Would you recommend it? Yes, this, 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 um, this, el sabor, ¿cómo dices? Favor, sabor. Flavor? Flavor? Uh -huh, this flavor is like the chicken okay so yes. anca serrana. i have heard of that in huayua like i i have heard this they sell yes in in huayua. Huayua. Uh -huh. in gastronomica I have, uh -huh. I have never tried it because i don't know if i would like it yeah. okay <laughs> yeah but anca serrana. yeah i was actually thinking on that like that's kind of exotic as well i, I don't know if you guys knew but there is something that um i find very very interesting um, but in Italy, there is a kind of cheese that, well, to get its, its proper taste, taste sorry, um, they have to grow um, maggots or like worms inside of the cheese. It's called, it's called, sorry, or referred to as the kasumarsu. That's the, the, the name for this cheese. And they say it's amazing. Like it's the best thing you can eat. But I don't know if I will be okay with that because it, 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 like you will feel like you're eating worms. But still, they say it's super salty. Like the saltness is amazing. The creaminess is very um, delicious. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know if you guys will be willing to try that. But me, myself, 
I will never, I think I will never um, like to try any kind of cheese that has had living animals inside of it. Anyway, um, so before we get started, do we have any questions? Anything that has popped up in the last couple hours or everything is just going as smoothly as always? ¿Tenemos todo, todo claro? ¿Alguna duda que haya surgido en las últimas horas? Okay, I will take that as a no. And as I mentioned, today we are going to be talking or covering the topic three word phrase solvers. We have the regular ones. If you guys have already seen the video, you will probably already know the meaning for many of them. But I also brought some new ones, some not spicy, but some interesting ones. Now, have or get something done. This is um, the first thing we're going to be covering. Now, how are we going to use it? Well, we use have or get to describe a service performed for you by someone else. We have two different ways in which we can do this. The first one is with an active voice. Remember, when you use the active voice, it means that the person um, is the main focus in the, in the sentence. Like the one who is performing the action is going to be taken as the main part of the sentence itself. And how should it go? Well, it should go as following. Do you know um, where I can have someone fix my bike? So here we have it, someone fix. And that's why we're going to refer to it as an active voice, because we need a person to fix the bike. And that's why we're going to ask for this person to perform a task. Remember, when we do that, when we mention the person and the task or the activity, that's when we are actually using the active voice of the sentence. And here we have some examples for the possible answers. You can have Hazel's personal services fix your bike. So once again, when you go ahead and mention the person who is going to be developing the task before the task itself, then you are um, actually using the active voice. Another way in which you can identify how or when you're going to be using the passive is when you mention this, the object of the sentence in the middle or before you mention the verb. But here, once again, we have it like Hazel Personal Services is going to be performing that action. It's going to be carrying out the action of fixing the bike. Now, next one up is you can get it. You can get a repair shop to fix your bike. Um, okay, so here will be two of the examples in which we are using the active voice of the sentence. When we use passive, we're going to have a few differences. We're going to be identifying those in a little bit. Now, the question should sound or should be a stricter as following. Do you know where I can have my bike fixed? So it's basically the same uh, kind of a structure. However, here, we don't mention a person. We don't mention anyone who is going to be performing a task. We want to have the object be fixed or the object to receive the action. And that is why we call this a passive voice because we don't have any person being mentioned as the important one who is going to be carrying out that action. So uh, the possible answers should be as following. You can have your bike fixed by, and here we have it. Remember that I mentioned before when we use the passive, we normally have um, these connectors there in between. Here it will be by Hazel's, uh, Hazel's personal services. So Hazel's is not necessarily the most important section of the, of the sentence. Here, instead of Hazel's, could be any other, um, well, shop that can be mentioned. Uh, and it wouldn't make a huge difference. It will be completely different if you said um, you can have Hazel personal services, as in the first option, fix your bike. Because here you are recommending 
hazels specifically because you think they are going to do a good job. Now, when we use passive voice, the um, actually the, the person or the subject of this sentence can be replaced by anyone because here we are only providing an example and anyone or any shop specifically here could play the same role. And that is also something very important to have in mind when we use the passive voice because the, as the person or the subject is not that important or that relevant in the sentence, you don't need or um, depend on that person carrying out the action. Okay, and the second way in which you can answer to this question would be as following. You can get your bike fixed at a repair shop. So once again here, it's not um, that drastic the change because here we just uh, mentioned the example of a repair shop. So we're not going to be too specific or we're not going to be using the connector in between by because here we just um, recommend a place where the person can go. So it's not any um, anything specifically mentioned or not um, a place that has anything to do with like a specifics. We only provide an example of where uh, we think the person could or should go to get the bike fixed. Muy bien, entonces tenemos verdad que cuando queremos que alguien haga algo por nosotros, sí, vamos a poder hacerlo con esta estructura. Es importante que al principio de las oraciones, mayormente en las oraciones, eh, de, ya en la respuesta, utilicemos esto al principio. You can have or you can get. Sí, you can have or you can get. Esto para, las, eh, para ambos casos. En el caso de los activos, cuando vamos a utilizar la forma activa de la oración, o sea, o la, la, la uh, persona, activa en la oración, vamos a mencionar de inmediato, justo después del have, a esa persona, ¿sí? O sea, la persona que nosotros consideramos que puede, ¿verdad?, realizar esa acción. Claro, después se menciona la acción, en este caso es fix, ¿sí? Fix, que sería, ¿verdad?, reparar, y luego tenemos el objeto que va a recibir esa acción. En el caso del get es bastante similar, o sea, igual aquí sabemos que estos dos se pueden utilizar de forma intercalada, o sea, podríamos decir, por ejemplo, you can get Hazel, uh, Hazel's personal services, fix your bike, o sea, no es eh, una gran, gran diferencia la que se va a hacer al utilizar cualquiera, ¿verdad? Puede ser have o puede ser get. Ahora, cuando utilizamos el get, eh, una vez más, tenemos eh, que aquí, ¿verdad? Se menciona inmediatamente a quien nosotros consideramos que podría ser la persona o el lugar que puede hacer un buen trabajo. Una diferencia que sí va a existir es que cuando utilizamos get, después eh, de mencionar la persona o el lugar, que es este caso específico, vamos a necesitar la partícula to, ¿sí? Get to. Eso es algo necesario para el to. El have no necesariamente, pero el get sí eh, va a necesitar, ¿verdad?, que antes del verbo, o sea, ya que este no es un verbo auxiliar que se utilice tan comúnmente como tal, entonces va a necesitar acá el apoyo de un infinitivo. Entonces vamos a decir get to fix or get, um, I don't know, to sing, um, get to, to dance for the birthday party. So anything that you got, want to get someone to do, then you are going to need to add this Um, particle before the main verb. Entonces, antes del verbo principal, cuando utilizamos get, será necesario, ¿verdad? Que utilicemos la partícula to. You can get a repair shop to fix your bike. Eso será solo en el caso de las oraciones, eh, pues, con un carácter más activo de la persona que va a realizar la acción. Muy bien, el siguiente sería para los pasivos. Cuando hablamos acerca del caso pasivo, ¿verdad?, Recordamos bastante bien, considero yo, que lo importante no es la persona que va a realizar la acción, sino la acción a realizar. Y aquí eh, también es muy bueno que tenemos el ejemplo, ¿verdad? Que, o sea, lo que estamos tratando de hacer es arreglar un objeto y por eso mismo el objeto va a ser el que se, eh, que se coloque como el que debe ser eh, arreglado, ¿sí? Entonces, el pasivo siempre va a funcionar para poder explicar eso. La acción que necesita ser desarrollada 
y quién podría o quién realizó en el caso ya de algo pasado, pero quién podría realizar esta acción. Por lo tanto, significa que esa persona que se menciona al final no es completamente inamovible, o sea, es una persona que puede ser reemplazada por cualquier otro que consideremos que puede tener las capacidades, ¿verdad?, para poder realizar esta acción. En el caso del sujeto activo, ese sujeto, ya que pues juega un rol muy importante en la oración, es básicamente inamovible, porque es ese sujeto el que yo creo que puede hacer el mejor trabajo, pero cuando estamos hablando de la forma activa, el sujeto puede en algún momento ser reemplazado por otro. Ok, um, no sé si tenemos alguna duda acerca de cómo funcionaría el hecho de utilizar have or get someone to do something. Una solo, just, uh, I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. um, in the passive voice, the verb, the, the second verb, no have or get the second, mm -hmm. always has to be in past. Yes. And yes. in that case, in, the, in that case, in passive, in the case of the verb get, we don't have to add the to. word to. Mm -hmm. We don't Just need the particle. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yes. Yes, using the active. Uh, the reason why is because the verbs in, in the passive voice are, as you mentioned, in the past participle form. And when we use the past participle form, there is basic, it is basically impossible or not go, it's not going to be recommended ever for you to use an article or um, not article, a particle before the verb. Because this verb is in past participle. Entonces, por eso es que no se utiliza. Se tendría que utilizar. Me refiero, si fuese verdad en presente, se tendría que utilizar. Pero el detalle es que como este verbo está en su forma del pasado participio, entonces ese verbo en sí no necesita ayuda, podríamos decir. Es como un estilo de verbo independiente. Entonces, el estar en esa, en esa forma o en esa estructura del pasado participio es lo que hace que este verbo eh, se desligue de la necesidad de colocar el to. En cambio, en este, como es una voz activa, además es una acción eh, del presente, pues sí es necesario, ¿verdad?, colocar este to acá para que se clarifique la diferencia o la separación que existe entre un verbo y el otro. En este caso acá, la separación se va a dar ya que este verbo está en pasado participio. Y no solo es pasado, que no nos vayamos a confundir, no solamente es en pasado simple, sino que es en pasado participio, cuando utilizamos eh, el pasivo. Recordamos que existe una diferencia, ¿verdad? Perdón, mayormente con los eh, verbos irregulares existirá una diferencia. Este, pues, ya que es un verbo regular, no va a tener mayor cambio. Pero si el verbo fuese uno distinto, ahí sí vamos a notar, ¿verdad? Mucho más el hecho de que, o sea, se necesita que sea un verbo en pasado participio. Pero sí, esa es una de las diferencias principales que van a existir cuando utilizamos, eh, pues, el, la forma activa y la forma pasiva. Por lo general, en la forma pasiva se presentan las oraciones en alguna de las formas del pasado. Puede ser pero principalmente, perdón, en pasado participio, principalmente. Ok, ¿alguna otra duda? ¿Any other question you guys may have? Seems like no. All right. So now we're going to move into a bit of a practice. Here we have the structure. Very simple, right? The active voice is, um, well, it's going to be completed when you add this. Remember I mentioned there's something that has to go at the beginning and it's this specific thing wait, over here. The thing over here, which is you can. Yes, you can is a must. You can is always going to be used. Um, the reason why is because most of the questions that are going to have Um, well, the have or get are going to start like this or are going to include in a moment the I can, um, well, form or I can structure. Because you're, what you're asking or what you want to know is who or uh, where something can be done for you. And that's um, the main thing that we are covering with having or get 
uh, or getting something done because you want someone else to do something for you. And when you want someone else to do something for you, then what you're asking people is going to be if they know who or where you can do that. And tell me, Juan. Yes. Instead of the, the world, can, can we use the word could? Yes. Yes. Remember that could is, in, in terms of meaning, it has a more polite meaning than can. Um, so yeah, you could use could as a replacement of, of can. You could say something like, do you know where I could, um, I could get, I don't know, milk for, for my cereal. Yeah, you know where I can get, um, oh wait, no, in this case is something done, yeah? Okay, sorry. So do you know where I can get a mechanic to run a test on my car yeah do, do you know where i can get a mechanic to run a test on my car so a mechanic will be the person and run a test will be the main verb so uh in that in that specific case you will have to answer something like you could get a mechanic to run a test on your car um or you could get and then you mentioned the name of the mechanic you may know you can get and I don't know, Mario Cerato. I don't know if that would be a, an option, um, but you can mention that. You could get Mario Cerato to run a test in your car. Entonces, ahí, es, es ese, es, había sido un error mío. En el caso específico, lo que se va a mencionar, ¿verdad? Será el nombre que nosotros conozcamos. Si ustedes no saben, obviamente, pues van a decir que no conocen a ningún mecánico que pueda hacer eso. Pero en el caso hipotético que ustedes lo conozcan, entonces mencionarían, ¿verdad? El nombre. Aquí, obviamente, después de él mencionar you could get. Sí, you could get. Y luego mencionan el nombre de la persona. Y luego la acción que se necesita que esa persona realice. So you could get, um, as I mentioned before, Mario Cerato, to run a test on your car. All right. So that will be the proper way to use could instead of can. You can always do that. Because could, as I mentioned previously, is going to sound much more polite. Now, here we have the destructor. Um, you should go as following. You could have or get, and then the base form of the verb. Now, how would you uh, build up a sentence following this premise? Um, let's start by getting a sentence from Evelyn. So tell me, what would be a good example of a sentence using the active voice where you tell someone how they can get something done? En este caso podríamos mencionar, por ejemplo, el verbo hmm, perform. Sí, perform. Perform, recordemos que se refiere, ¿verdad? A el hecho de um, presentar de cierta forma o pues realizar alguna clase de actuación o algo similar. So, perform. Ese sería el verbo principal. And we're going to use get as the verb for coming from, uh, from the structure. So, it will be, sorry, it will be something like, uh, you could get, okay, so, What will be the structure you will follow having this? Estos son como las partes que necesitamos utilizar ahora. ¿Cuál sería la mejor manera en la que podemos completar esta oración? Evelyn? I have the idea that you don't have a, a, the words. I don't have to use perform. O sea, you could get a perform by Perform se utiliza siempre okay. cuando hablamos de algo artístico. Por ejemplo, eh, alguien que baile, que alguien que cante, um, alguien que pues diga chistes. Eso sería una, una de, las, de las, o serían algunos de los ejemplos cuando podemos utilizar perform. Okay. 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 You can, you can get a perform 
Eh, aquí lo que necesitamos en este momento sería una persona. Entonces, uh, uh, Laura, podría ser un artista. Laura, dancing studio or something like that. Yeah, you could you could go with an artist, um, you, a singer. You could go with a dancing studio. Um, you could go with a clown if you know a clown. Maybe we can go with a with a singer. So yeah, you could get the perform from Laura to your birthday or. To... Okay, so here, aquí sería entonces Laura. You could get Laura. To you. Perform in your birthday. Sí, in your birthday. Vamos a tomar a Laura como la amiga que quedó clown. Sí, and so you could get uh, Laura perform in your birthday. Sería, podrías hacer que Laura, sí, eh, es que esta cosa, ¿cómo se traducía? Perform, perform. Es algo así como actuar, pero no necesariamente solo, se, solo engloba actuar, sino que es un verbo mucho más complejo, o sea, porque no solamente cubre, ¿verdad?, el hecho de actuar, sino que, pues, se refiere a, a presentar a veces información incluso, o a, a realizar alguna clase, como les decía, de canto, de baile. Entonces, perform es bastante más complejo que solamente um, actuar, pero eso podría ser como una forma en la cual podríamos interpretarlo en español. So you could get Laura performing your birthday. Eso significa probablemente que Laura es uh, buena, qué sé yo, cantando o quizá um, incluso actuando, ¿sí? Entonces podría ser una, una opción. Si no, podríamos, si sabemos, ¿verdad? De alguien más famoso, we could go with something like this. You could get Metallica performing your birthday. Y aquí creo que quizá ya tenemos un poco más más clara la idea, sí, porque, o sea, estamos hablando acerca de ya algo un poco más eh, famoso, digamos, de verdad. So you could get Metallica performing your birthday. Incluso hasta suena mejor porque, o sea, estamos hablando de algo más o menos reconocido. Sí, so you could get uh, Metallica performing your birthday sería eh, en el caso de que ustedes hayan preguntado, por ejemplo, ¿quién podría ser una buena opción para que tenga un show en mi cumpleaños? Sí. Um, another example. I would like to get another example. Y esta vez no les voy a, a poner entonces ningún, ninguna, ningún verbo específico ya, sino que ustedes eligen toda la oración. Beatriz, what will be another example that you will provide with the active voice on how you will get someone to do something? You could um, get you you could get um, Maricela fix uh, the system. Okay, Maricela fix the system. Yes, that is a proper sentence. Now. Here is only one thing. We're only missing one little detail. Hay una, un solo detalle que les mencioné que incluso a mí se me fue en este momento y no sé quién se ha dado cuenta de cuál es el detalle que nos hace falta. Si sí, cuando to utilizamos... Fix. Ajá. To. To, to fix. fix. Yeah. To fix. Sería ah. to fix or to perform. Es por eso por lo que no sonaba del todo natural. Eh, esto, sí, you could get Metallica to perform in your birthday. Sería diferente si utilizamos have, sí. You could have Marcela fix the system. You could have Marcela fix the system. That makes much more sense because here we're not using um, a verb that depends on the particle to. Así que esta sería la mejor manera, ¿verdad? You could have Marcela fix the system or you could get Metallica to perform in your birthday. Remember, that's the tiny difference that exists between the two. We need to use this before the verbs when we use get. Ok, entonces esta sería la voz activa. ¿Tenemos algún otro ejemplo que se nos haya ocurrido por ahí sin necesidad de tener que mencionar el nombre de alguno de ustedes? Active. Mm -hmm. I made one. Okay. Um, the question is, do you know where can I have someone repair my cell phone? And the answer is, 
you can have my uncle's cell phone store to repair your cell phone. Okay, do you know where can I have someone? Yeah, someone fix or repair my cell phone, right? Repair my cell okay, phone. Okay, repair my cell phone. That's the question. That's the question. And the answer is going to be, you can get. Okay, you can get my uncle's cell phone store. You can get my uncle's cell phone store. To repair or, or to fix your cell phone. To repair your cell phone. Okay, tell me, Emma. I have a question about the question is mm -hmm. I don't understand when I have to use can I and I can because I know in the first part is do you but in the second part is I can have or can I have here probably yeah. I just went so, by um, because of the structure, because it's a question. Creo que esto solamente fue un typo de mi, en mi caso, porque es como es pregunta, ¿verdad? De mi mente ya está grabado que en las preguntas el quien va antes que el, um, que el, la persona, pero quizá la mejor forma sería I can have. O sea, eso solamente fue quizás el detalle, como les digo, en mi caso, como las preguntas por lo general con can, el can tiene que estar eh, antes del sujeto y Aquí, o sea, el detalle es que la pregunta no inicia con can. La, la pregunta inicia con do you know. Entonces, de ahí en más, o do you know where, más bien. De ahí en más, el resto de la oración es una oración normal. Entonces, y puede estar estructurada de esta forma. Um, cuando utilizamos el can I have, es cuando directamente iniciamos esa pregunta, ¿verdad? Con el can. Entonces, aquí solamente fue el hecho de que, o sea, al ser una pregunta, para mí tenía que hacer can I have. Sí, pero eh, sería mejor I can have. Do you know where I can have someone fix my cell phone? Porque aquí lo que estoy pidiendo, ¿verdad? Es un estilo de consejo y además ese otro motivo de que esta parte de acá es la que ya toma la responsabilidad de estructura de pregunta. Por lo tanto, el resto de la pregunta misma puede ser eh, formulada, ¿verdad? Con una estructura de una oración regular. Entonces, eh, ajá, ese simplemente fue un, un typo, un, un, no sé, un gaje del oficio, pero eh, no habría necesidad de escribirlo siempre con el can I. Cuando se va a escribir can I have someone uh, repair my cell phone, será cuando iniciemos directamente la pregunta, ¿verdad? Con ese can. Pero aquí no va a ser 100% necesario que, um, que se utilice en esa forma. Okay, so um, moving on, we have the passives. And the passive, as I mentioned before, we're going to need to use here, um, as always, or as part of the, of the um, formula, the you can part, or you can get if you want. Then, remember, you're going to mention the object, the thing that has to be repaired. And then you're going to use the past participle form of the verb. So what will be a good example for a structure or a sentence like this? Emma, do you have any idea of an example that can place uh, its role in this specific case? Yeah, maybe. Uh, you can get your cake cooked at Tecleña. Tecleña? Yes. Okay. Tecleña. There we go. So, there we go. That's a really, really good example. You can get your cake. Yes, your cake cooked um, at Tecleña. And... That is in passive voice. Now, it will be completely different if we go with an active voice because here we, sh we should move this um, to this section over here and it will sound something like, you can get tecleña 
to cook, remember? Because we need to use the particle to before, or the infinity particle before the main verb. So you can get tecleña to cook your cake. But as we're using a passive form, we're going to say you can get your cake cooked at tecleña. Very good example. Thank you. Now, how about you, um, Daniel? What would be an example you can use with a passive voice for this um, examples we are placing right now? Okay, teacher. Quiero ver. You can get a... Esperen, que no se me ocurre, teacher. Está bien. Okay, you can have... I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said something like, uh, guys, el oficio. How do you say that in English? Uh, it would be a... It has to do with business. I remember that the word business is used in it. Um... Dude, I have this this word. It's right on the tip of my mouth, on my tongue. But ah, uh, en serio, te juro que la tengo justo aquí. Yo ah, la uso seguido. Es use no. Uh, it's not use of business. Come on. Ah, come on. I forgot. Pero sí tiene que ver con business. It has to do with business. Like at the end of that, you say business. But there is something that comes before that I just forgot. Um, ah, no, I forgot. Pero bueno, Daniel, por ahora, vamos a ver. Mientras, tal vez, tal vez recuerdo cómo se decía esa palabra. Pero Daniel, um, ¿cuál sería? You can have your... Okay, you can, you can get your, your ticket fly. At Avianca's office. Muy bien. Buen ejemplo, vamos bien, pero vamos a necesitar un verbo más. Entonces podríamos decir, you can get your ticket reserved, ¿sí? Reserved mm -hmm. or booked, más bien. En este caso se utiliza booked. Booked by mm -hmm. Avianca, ¿sí? By okay. Avianca. You can have your ticket booked by Avianca. Entonces, sería que vamos a necesitar, ¿verdad? Que el, el billete sea agendado por Avianca. Sí, you can have your ticket booked by Avianca. Recuerden que anteriormente, en el caso de las active voices, teníamos aquí la diferencia que cuando utilizamos get, se necesita utilizar el to. Pues, con las passive, cuando utilizamos el have, por lo general, vamos a utilizar también el adverbio by, ¿sí? O la preposición by. Por lo general, vamos a utilizar este, um, esta preposición. En el caso del get, podríamos utilizar cualquiera de las dos. No es que sea obligación siempre utilizar el at, pero se ve mucho más regular que se utilice de esa forma, ¿sí? Vamos a, a ver mucho más común que eh, se utilice el by en el caso de las... Um... Ok, un momento, es que de verdad no voy a dejar que esto se me vaya. Just, I, I just need to search this, this uh, thing. Ok. Um... All right. Here we go. No, it's not that. Man, it's an idiom that has to do with business. Um, mm -hmm. Guys del oficio, no. Come on, mate. Solo me parecen explicaciones, but I don't need that. I need a translation. I swear to God that I have it on the tip of my tongue, but I forgot. En serio, qué triste cuando pasa esto. Pero sí, estoy seguro que lo, que lo, que lo tenía, pero bueno. Sorry, Emma, I failed. Pero mañana sí estoy seguro que eso va a ser lo primero con lo que inicie la clase, cuando, cuando te unas. Eh, les voy a decir, porque sí, es una, es una frase común para mí, 
ya que una de las materias que más eh, pues imparto en la universidad tiene que ver con negocios, entonces si utilizo a menudo, ¿verdad? Esa, um, esa frase, pero habit of business, creo que era habit of business, sí, parece, o business habits, algo así, creo que era habits of business, o si no, sería algo así como business habits. Algo como eso sería lo que se puede utilizar, ¿verdad? Para hablar acerca de los gajes del oficio. Business habits. I think you can go with that. So, hopefully that's going to work. Eso es de lo que me acuerdo, lo, lo menos lo que me acuerdo ahorita. Y creo que sí, esa es la forma correcta, la forma más apropiada de decir, ¿verdad? Los gajes del oficio en inglés. All right. Now, moving on. This is the thing we were supposed to be talking for most of the lesson. We have just landed on it. And it's the three word phrase or verbs. And uh, the reason why I find this topic very interesting is because normally um, you use two words when you use uh, phrasal verbs, but there are a few of them that are going to include three different words. For example, broken up with. Broken up with is a phrasal verb that in English we are going to use to refer to one single activity. And that is what I was mentioning at the beginning of the class, that in Spanish, and that is the reason why Spanish is so broad and so hard for some people to learn, because we come up with new words for new activities. In English, however, what they do is that they put more words together so that they can get another result or another action being performed. In the case of broken up with, it's something, um, or in what case do you guys consider you could use broken up with? Um, how would you use it, Evelyn? Hello, Evelyn. All right. Um, how about um, Beatriz? How will you use broken up with? Okay, Daniel, maybe? Uh, teacher, uh, for example, okay. my, my cell phone broken up with... Um, with the um, martillo. I don't, I don't know. Probably, probably. Pero ahí nos estamos yendo por el significado literal de la palabra primera, verdad, o principal de este phrasal verb que sería break o broke. Pero sabemos que es un breakup. Mm -hmm. Específicamente solo breakup. ¿Sabemos qué significa breakup? No, oh, teacher, no sabemos. No sabemos qué significa breakup. No, no, no. Okay, breakup. I know. You know? Uh, yes. To finish a relationship. To end, uh, yeah, when I you know. end a relationship. Okay. That is breakup, I... ¿sí? Entonces, when you say broken up with, estamos hablando acerca de cuando alguien terminó una relación con otro alguien, ¿sí? Broken up with. So, por ejemplo... Eh, eso es porque está completamente en pasado, ¿sí? o sea, eh, pero podría estar en presente, break up with, y no habría ningún problema. Pero si ustedes están contando la historia, eh, podrían decir, ¿verdad? I had to use broken up with that guy when he went to live with another one, and they already had three children. Sí, o sea, sería broken up with. Justo había terminado con, sí, había terminado con, sería broken up with. Um, en español, o sea, ahí sí, ¿verdad? No usamos solo una palabra, porque hay algunos casos tampoco es que nos inventamos palabras para absolutamente todo, pero eh, algunas de estos three word phrase verbs sí se van a ver representados con una sola palabra en español. Pero broken up with, entonces sería había terminado con o terminar con, sí. Terminar con si lo usamos solo en break up with. O sea, si lo usamos en presente, sería terminar con. Pero... Bueno, básicamente ya estamos llegando al final, así que quizá mañana vamos a poder darle verdad más continuidad al resto, porque sí, estos son bien interesantes y 
en realidad no existen tantos de los free world free servers no, no existen tantos tantos de los que sí hay varios serían de los regular phrase or verbs, o sea, los verbos para, los verbos fraciales, que esos incluyen solamente dos palabras. De eso sí habrá una gran cantidad. Pero bueno, eso será algo que terminemos de cubrir el día de mañana. Eh, por ahora solo me voy a asegurar que business habits sería, o sea, verdad, la forma apropiada de decir gajes del oficio. Y pues nada. Thank you guys very much for your time. See you tomorrow and I hope you have an amazing night. So, see ya. Thank you, teacher. You're very welcome.